My name is Sally Penny. I'm a barrister and the founder of Women in the Law UK. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this lunchtime webinar. It's one o'clock. Thank you for waiting in the waiting room. There are lots of us joining us this afternoon for Kate Dodd's presentation. Some of you may have heard Kate if you attended our annual conference, which is always called Empowering You to Do What You Do Best. Kate was there. She'd also spoken to, uh, to us before at two other seminars you know the real world where we could actually talk to people and have a real talk and not be scared of this virus um so if you haven't heard her before you're in for a treat um she's a solicitor at pinson's uh, well i don't want to ruin her brilliant uh, ah. introduction so we're going to make a start with our fantastic speaker kate over to you hi everybody um can everyone hear me okay yep got some yeah brilliant we've got some thumbs up um so yes i'm kate dodd um apologies i'm wearing my glasses any of you who have ever seen me before won't have seen me in glasses perhaps with the exception of sean who i worked with many years ago um i've got to the stage now where i can't really be bothered to put contact lenses in i don't know about the rest of you um you're very lucky that i've actually got a little bit of makeup on today so uh, this is a real treat for you all um it's a, it's a treat that my colleagues sadly don't get so i tend to mainly be in gym kit all the time so i'm sure that lots of you are the same <clears throat> interestingly it took a little bit of the imposter in me to get over not wearing full makeup on Zoom calls and Teams and all the rest of it. And it's been quite interesting seeing people's confidence building about being a bit more themselves during this time. Um, you'll see behind me, I've got a wall of, um, well, I'm, uh, Sally said that we're not allowed to swear, so I'm not going to say anything rude, but I've got a wall of kind of artwork and photos and things um, in, in, in the study that I work in. And for ages, I used to use one of those virtual backgrounds because um, I used to think, oh, I don't want people to see, you know, what, what I'm like and what my life is like. And then I think as lockdown has continued and kind of I've been thinking about how imposter syndrome works around lockdown and how imposter syndrome works when you don't have the opportunity to have that face to face contact with each other to people to say oh that was great in a meeting or you know lots of you will not be doing the kind of work that you were doing before um, I can see we've got quite a few students on as well so you know those students are not going to be seeing their lecturers and tutors in the same way so how do we deal with and overcome imposter syndrome particularly in these times okay now some of you have heard this this before lots of you will have been at the conference where I think I only had about about 10 minutes so we did a absolute gallop through at the conference yeah. and this is going to be much more in-depth um look into it some of you have been in have come along to hear me speak in more depth about imposter syndrome um but hopefully this will still be really useful for you and what i would love to know afterwards is what you have been doing what you've been working on because what we're doing today is we're talking about what imposter syndrome is and we're also talking about how to overcome it so i'd like to know what those of you who have been to one of my sessions before what you've put into practice uh, to start to overcome your or your own imposter syndrome um, okay so imposter syndrome a little bit about me um first uh, which is that um i am here we go i'm just going to try and move on to my next slide here we go this is me this is me with straightened hair and makeup on so um uh, i'm currently looking about 15 20 years older than i did in that photo even though it's only about six months old um i think we probably all are to an extent but um yeah so i'm kate dodd i work um at pinsent masons which is a, a law firm that most of you will have heard of um i'm an employment lawyer by background um and about oh gosh sorry if i I've done something wrong here, Sally. There we go. There we go. Um, um, about, gosh, nearly four years ago now, I moved from doing fee earning employment law to become diversity and inclusion specialist, basically. Um, having spent many, many years doing diversity and inclusion work as, as, a, uh, as a fee earner, basically. And what I do now is I look at um, our business and I try to um, help our business to become a more inclusive place to work 
um, and really, I suppose what my role is, if I was summing it up, is I, I head up kind of belonging, what it means to belong um, to a law firm, what it means for the people who are working at our firm, how, how we make them feel proud of being part of Pins and Masons, and also making sure that everybody gets an equal opportunity um, to succeed, which, you know, is, is can be harder than, than it should be really in law firms, as I'm sure probably you're all aware of, whether you're working in law firms or working in barristers' chambers. And one of the things that I started talking to people about a few years ago was about imposter syndrome, which was something that was relatively new to me at the time. Um, and since then, um, I've talked extensively about it and it's become uh, a subject that I'm very passionate about. I've also seen people really overcome imposter syndrome. So I'm really excited to know about those of you who've, who've been looking and thinking about imposter syndrome for a while. I'm excited to know what your progress is like. And for everybody else, I'm excited to introduce you uh, to this as a topic. So what is imposter syndrome? Okay. Imposter syndrome is essentially a, a syndrome, as it, as it suggests. It's something that people don't like talking about. It's something that people consider to be a weakness. And it's something which for about 25 years now has been the subject of debate amongst um, psychological, psychiatric, etc. circles, with people talking about this syndrome where they have a debilitating inability to recognize their own success or what the other people talk about having crippling self-doubt. So whether you suffer from imposter syndrome or you know somebody who does, you're going to find today useful. I was not a sufferer of imposter syndrome. Um, and interestingly, um, it was something that I hadn't really come into contact with in my personal life. Although as I started to understand more about it, I recognized that pretty much everyone I knew, including myself, had aspects of imposter syndrome in me. And particularly, I found it kind of comes up at certain times. Some of you will have had it when you've been going through promotion processes. I remember going through the, the partner promotion process um, at my previous firm, um, feeling very much like an imposter, um, certainly starting this new role um, at Pins at Masons, feeling like a massive imposter. Um, so it's something that I think can happen to us all, depending on what kind of time of life we're at. So I'm going to attempt to be uh, to be a bit whizzy now. So I'm going to ask you all to um, to put up your hands if you um, agree. I'm I'm just looking for the participant screen here. Um, so people, so if you just want to put your hand up, if you agree with these. Um, these statements. So if you think they're true, then put your hand up. And if you don't think they're true, uh, then you keep your hand down. Okay. So the first one is, um, sorry, Sally, I think I've just taken myself back off the screen again. Here we go. So the first one is who thinks imposter syndrome is rare? Anyone think it's rare? Okay. Not many of you. So do you all know what you're doing in terms of putting your hand up or not? I think it's a thumbs up, isn't it? So, okay. Uh, the answer is, it's not rare at all. It's really very common. 70% 70, 70 of people in a recent survey admitted to suffering from imposter syndrome at some point in their career. So um, as I said, it's not necessarily something that will, will afflict all of you all the time, but there will be part times in your life when it will, will really kind of come across and will, will sideswipe you. Next one, certain types of people are more likely to suffer from imposter syndrome. Anyone think that's a yes? Yeah, a few of you. Yeah, quite a few of you are raising your hands on that one. Yeah. Yes, so that, that is true. So it, it's believed that people who are perfectionists, um, people um, who are hard on themselves, and you all know if you're hard on yourself or not, people who are lacking in self-confidence for any reason, and, and that doesn't mean like a chronic lack of self-confidence. That might just be in certain situations you find yourself struggling for self-confidence. Um, people in roles that they didn't expect to find themselves in, or perhaps people going for roles that they didn't expect to find themselves going for, um, also report imposter syndrome. And interestingly, it, I think it's quite closely linked to social mobility. So sometimes you see it being particularly prevalent amongst people who are the only one of their friends to go to university or the, the, the only one of their family to uh, work as in a, you know, in the legal profession or in, indeed in any profession. So there is definitely something in there around um, 
people particularly feeling uh, like they are maybe out of their comfort zone. What about the next one? Raise your thumbs for me if you believe that imposter syndrome is a psychiatric disorder in its own right. Yeah, we've got a couple, not many. Yeah, a few. So, the prize. I know, sorry. There, the prize is, uh, what can I offer you? I can offer you, uh, I can offer you some baking because that's all we appear to be doing is baking and eating the baking, which is not good for my COVID weight gain. Um, but you have to come to Didsbury to collect it. So I'm not sure you want to do that. But I can so give you a copy of my book. Oh, well, there you go. There we go. Um, <laughs> So the answer is no, it's not a psychiatric disorder in its own right, but it is very much linked um, to, <clears throat> pardon me, some people report suffering from imposter syndrome and anxiety or suffering from imposter syndrome and depression. Um, so it is, it can be linked to other kind of disorders, but it's not a disorder in its own right. And you certainly don't need to have any other kind of underlying um, condition in order to feel like an imposter. What about this one? Imposter syndrome is suffered more by women than by men. How many of you think that's true? Yeah, hands going up there straight away. Yeah, lots of you are saying yes. Interesting, really interesting. I, I think it, I swing around on this a little bit. I think to some extent it is, but I also think that the jury's out um, on this because it seems to be that all the all the research and the kind of the, the talking on this is is aimed at women and it's a lot of it is by women but actually a lot of men have Im suffer from imposter syndrome but like all aspects and I lead on mental health at Pins at Masons that's a big part of my role is leading on our approach to well-being and mental health and you may have all heard of the mindful business charter and in fact Sally at some point I'm going to beg to come back on and talk to you all about the Mindful Business Charter um, and what that means for, for lawyers. And when we talk about things like mindfulness, well-being, mental health, women find it much easier to engage than men do. Um, it's very much programmed into the psyche, the male psyche, that, that, you know, that they shouldn't be talking and shouldn't be discussing and sharing feelings. So I don't believe for a minute that only women suffer from this. I just think women find it easier to talk about it, basically. But... <clears throat> There is also definitely an aspect of it which le lends itself more to the female psyche. So you will all um, uh, have be aware of this idea that women um, will necessarily, let's say that there are 10 parts, 10 things in a job description, women will believe that they need to um, tick 10, if uh, maybe nine of those things in a job description before they apply. Whereas men will get to about five or six and think, brilliant, that's enough for me. I'm in. Um, and, and that is, is about imp the imposter again. So I do think that women are possibly a bit more predisposed towards it. Right, show of hands. Imposter syndrome only affects people in their professional or work lives. Who thinks that? A couple of you. Yeah. Really interesting not many of you are saying yes to that. And, and that is really interesting because the answer, although we talk about imposter syndrome a lot relating to um, work and professional development and careers and people feeling held back, this actually affects people in every aspect of their life. Um, and I've done this, I, do, I, I go around our offices around the globe to deliver this session face to face and it's really interesting at the end, the things that people come and say to you, and I'm sure any of you who give presentations are well aware of that feeling of you kind of get all the interesting stuff at the end when someone comes up to you and says, oh, could I just have a moment of your time? And people have come up to me and they have had engagements breaking off. They've had relationships. They've had friendships. And they've said, I just didn't feel like I was good enough. And one person told me about cheating on her partner because she said, well, we were engaged, it was going really well, but at the end of the day, I knew it was never gonna last. I knew I wasn't good enough for him. So I thought, well, if I press the destruct button, uh, then at least it's me that's kind of ruined it. And I've, I've not waited to be dumb. I've not waited for him to realize that I'm not good enough for him. Um, and 
she was like, I wish I knew about this then because I would have felt really differently. Um, and, you know, God, I felt really sad. Um, and, and it was really interesting, of course, that this idea that imposter syndrome can it affects such important decisions and all of you I'm sure will have, have if, if you have suffered from imposter syndrome will know that feeling of thinking oh god I'm not I can't I'm just not going to go for that job or I'm not going to go for that promotion or you know I'm not going to ask for that pay rise because I just don't know whether to do it or not I don't know I don't know whether I should and of course it's it that can happen in any part of life I had a situation last week um I've changed um I've, I've changed line managers recently and my new line manager and my old line manager um, don't have that much to do with each other. So it's not as if they talk all the time. And we were talking about bonuses. And I suddenly thought, oh, God, I'm going to get forgotten when the bonus, you know, I knew this bonus discussion was going on. And I was thinking, I'm going to get forgotten. And I thought, well, I can't possibly email and ask who's going to who's responsible for my bonus because I want a bonus. Um, and I didn't do anything. And I left it for a day. And then I just thought, why? why am I waiting to hope and see if I get a bonus or not? I might not get one, but I need to say to them, look, guys, uh, I'm not sure that, that either of you are thinking about me for the bonus. So can you make sure that one of you is, please? And it's that kind of, that feeling of, oh, I don't want to trouble them or I don't want to be seen to be presumptuous. And I just thought, sod it, you know, sod it. What would, what would I be telling all of you lot to do? So it's that kind of, can be something really small, as small as that, sending an email um, as opposed to thinking that this is all kind of has to be really life changing stuff. And what about this one? Once you achieve a certain level of success, you are unlikely to suffer from imposter syndrome. Hands up if you think that's true. Yes, we've got a few hands going up there, a few sneaking up, a few people shaking their heads. I can see Carolyn shaking her head quite vigorously there. Um, the answer is no. So some of the most famous people who suffer from imposter syndrome, Albert Einstein. Yeah, who knew? Who knew that Albert Einstein, if only he had been able to join us for this Zoom call, if only he'd existed in the 2020s, imagine what he might have been able to achieve. Albert Einstein said, the exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. Yeah. And now, so any of you who are beating yourselves up for feeling like a bit of an imposter, if Albert Einstein's allowed to feel like it, then I think we can all let ourselves off the hook on that. Mayor Angelou, again, um, said that she's, I feel, I've run a game and they're going to find me out. Michelle Pfeiffer, I think people are going to find out I'm really not very talented. Uh, Kate Winslet, sometimes I wake up in the morning and think I can't do this, I'm a fraud. Yeah. So those are all people in the public eye who are struggling. And one thing I've noticed in my sessions at work is that the partners creep in and sit at the back and they think, oh, you know, I mustn't be seen to be an imposter here because I'm meant to be the partner. And, I, you know, the partners, this kind of idea that they have to be absolutely perfect. Well, I can tell you now that the partners come up to me at the end as well, and some of them don't arrive, and some of them say to me, oh, I wish I'd come along to that one. Um, so please don't think that you can outrun this. Um, and it, it, it's an important thing to remember, because you might find it, you feel a bit disappointed. You might say, right, I've got that promotion, so why don't I feel like I deserve it? Now, it's not because you don't deserve it. It's just because of imposter syndrome, and that's what's going on here. And I, I left school you won't believe this but I left school more than 20 years ago now I know I look like I only left in the last few weeks but <laughs> I I'm still very good friends with um 12 of the women I was at school with and they are doctor got two doctors we've got a GC general counsel of a PLC we've got marketing directors country directors for huge businesses and I asked them about whether they suffer from imposter syndrome and interestingly over half of them said that they did and it's not something we had ever talked about and one of them who was the who's gc for a plc business said that every time she gets an email from her boss there's that moment where she thinks is this the minute where i'm going to be sacked you know is this the minute where it's like right your time's up we're calling time on you um and i was really interested in that because she's someone who is hugely self-confident so something is obviously going on there so it was named back in the 1970s. There was some psycholo psychology researchers called Ims and Clance. And what they saw 
was a phenomenon that seemed to really affect high achievers who were basically unable, and this is really, really important to understand about imposter syndrome. It's not about just low confidence generally in life. It's about being unable to internalize your own success. It's being unable to think, I got that job. Yay me. I'm brilliant. I got that job or, you know, I'm good enough for this. I've done well. Um, you know, I've, I've got that appraisal rating and I've got that because I deserve it. And it's this idea of this anxiety, perfectionism, self-doubt, um, excessive modesty. Uh, if we were in face to face, I'd have walked around at the beginning of our session and I'd have complimented a few of you. And I'd have heard you say, you know, I'd have said, oh, that's a really, I can, for some reason, I can only see Carolyn and Sally on my screen. So I could say to Carolyn, oh, I love that top. It's such a beautiful color pink on you, Carolyn. And Carolyn would say, oh, God, I've had it years. Oh, I found it at the back of the wardrobe. But oh, 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 I got this the other day in the sale. You know, it was 90% off. Why can't we just say thank you? You know, why can't we just say thank you and, and, and move on? And um, I and some of you will have heard me say this before, but I've got two daughters. And, and I'm pleased to say that one of them is now 10 and is still doing this. Whenever you pay her a compliment, she essentially she does a little pirouette and fluffs her hair and says I know I'm fabulous aren't I or she'll go and like gaze in the mirror and and, and you know acknowledge that she really is quite as, as as lovely as you've told her that she is and you know we don't want to create a generation of megalomaniacs and I don't want any of you to kind of walk away from here thinking well she's telling us that we need to be terribly arrogant I don't mean that for a minute but if somebody pays you a compliment the only thing you should be saying in response is thank you mm. yeah mm. And if you start paying a compliment back, it doesn't mean anything. If I say, Carolyn, I love your top. And you say, oh, thanks, Kate. I love your dress, my, which is rather nice. My Sainsbury's. This is <laughs> the only place <laughs> I can buy. I can only buy clothes in Sainsbury's. So that's where everything's from at the moment. My Sainsbury's denim dress. Um, <laughs> but just say thank you. Yeah. Don't be excessively modest. And the one thing that's really interesting and the thing that seems to define imposter syndrome is this fear of being found out. Yeah the fear of being discovered mm. and people talk about it like being in a vip area of a bar that you're not meant to be in and you've just swiped a glass of champagne from a, a waiter that's passing with a tray and you're not actually meant to be in that drinks reception and it's that feeling of being kicked out or in the good old days when i used to um go to the gym um, I used to sneak into body pump even though I was never on the list because I was never organized to get myself onto the list a week in advance like I was meant to and I'd quietly set up and I'd be there thinking oh god if she start you know the instructor would pick up the register and start calling names out and I was thinking I'm not on this list I know she's going to discover me any moment now and I'll be ejected from the class and have to hang my head in shame and it's that feeling that people talk about this kind of being somewhere that you know you shouldn't be and waiting to be to be caught basically so that's this is kind of the essence of it what imposter syndrome is so imposter syndrome is a syndrome and anyone who recognize it anyone who suffers from it will recognize this this idea that everyone knows more than you know yeah this idea that that other people have got it all going on and i don't know about you but any of you who are working from home everyone else seems to kind of do better at working from home you know everyone else seems to be better at the technology or people seem to be you know smashing it out of the park with homeschooling you know all these mums posting these bloody sorry sally i won't swear posting these photos on you know i've left a load of whatsapp groups because i can't bear everybody else's really smug photos of their perfect lives and their amazing children all kind of smashing yeah, yeah. working from home in the homeschooling thing while I'm floundering from one thing to another uh, never really feeling like I'm in I'm actually kind of getting anywhere and of course it's just recognizing the fact that we're all just we're all facing the same stuff as, as, as each other but in particular since social media we've created the monster of people kind of showing their best side showing what they want people to be able to see what they want people uh, to think about them Enjoying and them. and all of us um, are of course doing the best we can whether that be during lockdown or before and I'm sure we will all continue to do the best we can afterwards and it's recognizing that other people don't know a load more stuff than we do and other people aren't a load better than we are everyone has just got their own thing going on and everyone is just doing the best they can basically so 
the first step of overcoming imposter syndrome is about stopping underestimating yourself and also stopping overestimating other people. Yeah. Because other people, you know, I can see we've got, you know, lots of you law students on here. Other people might have parents that work in law firms or they might have friends in high places or they might have amazing training contracts, um, you know, set up to go to great firms, etc. cetera, or, um, you know, places in, in, um, uh, in chambers, you know, they might have a, a pupillage in a chambers, but we're all just doing the best that we can and nobody is any better than anyone else. So that's a really important um, thing to remember you know, this idea, getting rid of this idea that I can't possibly do well, given what I know of myself, yeah? This is probably the slide I love the most today. There's one other one that's really quite funny, but this is a great slide, which is about stopping obsessing about our own flaws and stopping thinking that everyone else has got everything absolutely sorted and you know they look amazing on every zoom call and they don't ever seem to be eating their breakfast at half past 12 like i was just before when sally and i first started speaking and this idea that if we knew what each other were thinking how comf how comforting that would be if you knew how desperately frightened uh, this person who was interviewing you ha was when they were interviewed how joyous that would be uh, you know, and if you knew how much people worried about doing things that you worry about, how lovely that would be. And that's really part of the whole reason for women in the law. And that's the thing that I absolutely love the most about women in the law is that it's such a collaborative kind of, it's an opportunity to share and to understand more about the fact that we've all got this stuff going on. So, you know, if you've got somebody who you really admire at work um, or at, at university or wherever you're at, it might be worth finding out a little bit more about them and having a conversation, asking them to have a coffee or a virtual catch up with you, a virtual coffee and just say, you know, I've got this thing coming up and I'm really worried about it. How did you manage this? Or how did you deal with this type of thing uh, when you were at my stage and ask them, find out what their secrets are, because that will, of course, will give you great comfort. Right. So. Sally, you've got the mug there, which I'm very jealous of. I've, I've not. On, I'm I gave, afraid, I I've gave not got, you one. Oh, I've, I've definitely not had one of those, but um, I'll let you off. I'll let you off. I've got my grammar. Which one have you got? No, I've got a grammar mug for when my children come in and constantly ask me about <laughs> certain elements of grammar, which, of course, I've forgotten anyway. OK, so I want you to now make a bit of a note. Um, and and um, Sally, are we doing OK for time on this? Yeah, we can never run slightly. I'll get my clerks to delay the judge. Nobody oh, should right. Do. What time are we due to finish today then? Today we're due to finish it at two, the entire thing. But you finish your presentation. Yeah. And you just want time for it. And few. we'll have some questions and things. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a real quick whiz through then what kind of imposter you are. Um, the different types of imposter are, are here. I'm going to whiz through them. You'll see at the bottom of this slide is the name of a book. The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, Why Capable People Suffer from the Imposter Syndrome and How to Thrive in Spite of It by someone called Valerie Young. It's an amazing book, yeah? So any of you who are feeling like some of this stuff is resonating with you, have a look at this book. Um, have a look at Valerie Young um, and, and see if you can, um, you know, see if you can get hold of a copy of that um, because there is such a lot of interesting um, information out there that's available. Okay, right. So I'm going to ask you to very quickly note down um, if you are any of these things. And then what we're going to do at the end is have some thoughts about how to overcome things. So are you a perfectionist? This is somebody who struggles to delegate, is a micromanager, or somebody who feels that you have to be perfect all the time. And if you're not perfect, then you really beat yourself up. Yeah. So that's that person is a perfectionist. The superman or the superwoman. So this is the person who stays late, always the latest person at the office. Um, doesn't, oh, I don't have time to do that anymore. I don't have time to uh, go to the gym. I haven't got time for netball. I, I haven't got time to read the book and be part of this reading, um, you know, reading club. Um, I haven't got time to do this. Um, so somebody who's let things fall by the wayside and who feels that they haven't really earned 
their title uh, despite all of their qualifications. Mm. The natural genius, which I think lots of people probably are on this call, which is that person, the clever one in the family, the clever child, the clever person in your group of friends, uh, somebody who's always very used to getting straight A's, but finds themselves very much, um, uh, you know, really very much invested in that. So the thought of not getting a straight A or not passing something is, is absolutely devastating. The rugged individualist is the individual, is the person who wants to do things on their own. No, I don't need anyone's help. I can do it. It's fine. I can do it myself. No problem. Um, I'm, I'm not going to delegate that work because, I, you know, I actually, you know, I, it's better if I did it myself. I could do it quicker myself. Yeah. So this person who is um, the has to do things their own way finds it very difficult to say, look, I need a day off or I need some time off. And it's all about the, you know, the client doesn't need it on this day. So therefore we don't, you know, you don't have to do that for me now. Um, and, you know, the kind of person who, when I said, have you got a mentor? And if any of you haven't got a mentor, it's a great idea to get one. Um, you know, thinking, no, I don't really need that. Then we've got the expert, the person who wants to be the absolute best at something, who needs to know everything, who would never believe in, in, ever consider um, only applying for a job if they had nine out of the 10 things. Goodness me, they'd need to have 10 out of the 10 things, yeah? So um, the person who wants to always have um, a certificate to show, uh, and people laugh at me when I say this, but then they come to me at the end of the session and say, do we get a certificate for attending this imposter syndrome talk? This <laughs> imposter so you know, it, it's definitely there. And people feeling that they don't know enough, you know, people seem to think I'm the expert on, you know, tax in the USA, but, you know, I, I, I'm sure there's more I'm, I could know about this, or I'm the expert on, um, you know, employee status, but I'm sure I could know more. And therefore, I feel like I need to read absolutely everything. And then, of course, is the real imposter who none of you are. Sorry, I'm just going to silence these phones. I've, I've taken every device in my house and put it in this room so that my children can't use my bandwidth so I'm pinging here so um so yes of course the real imposter is that person and we all know them and we're probably all a bit worried that we know them because we think that we might be them yeah so it's about this idea of um this real imposter is a person who's exaggerated their own achievements and their own accomplishments this person is somebody who is um gives a great performance in an interview and then gets into the workplace and gets into doing the role and you're thinking how has this person actually got us so far because they're an imposter yeah they know what they're doing they, they they've wanted to get into that position and they've got there and they have a hugely elevated elevated sense of entitlement and a sense of their own kind of genius compared to what they should do so some of you will, some of that will resonate with some of you. Some of it, it will be quite new to some of you, but have a think about it and have a look at it. And one thing I would really say to you all is that um, have a look. If, if you're not a big reader and you don't fancy the, the Valerie Young book, then what you might do is, um, is think about um, having a look at these TED Talks on imposter syndrome. So if this stuff has kind of lit a bit of interest, a little fire in you that thinks, hmm, you know, I, I definitely want to know about more about imposter syndrome, then have a look at some TED Talks. And there's someone called Lou Solomon, who is really funny and really interesting. And she talks a lot about imposter syndrome. And she describes imposter syndrome like having a crappy best friend in your head who says, hmm, you don't deserve to be here, or you've done it right this time, but don't forget next time you're not going to be so lucky. And for her, she named that voice in her head. And when I've talked to people about this before, a lot of people say, oh, well, I know exactly who that person in my head is. It's my mum or it's my dad or it's my ex-boyfriend or it's my stepbrother. Or, you know, some of you have got somebody in your head who actually does this to you and says this to you. And for some of you, it's just internalized and it's something that you think. So. Just before we finish for questions, what I'm going to do is ask you to just take a bit of time as I whiz through these ideas of things that you can do to overcome imposter syndrome, the really quick and easy things you can do. And then when we go into the chat and the discussion um, in the kind of time that we've got left before two o'clock, what I'd love to know is if any of you have started putting any of these into place um, from the last time that we spoke, those of you who we have spoken to before. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. Okay. So, um, 
keeping a good file this is really important this is one of the most important things um, that i think you could do to overcome imposter syndrome which is every time someone pays you a compliment or says well done on a piece of work um, you keep that and you have a file an email inbox or somewhere on your phone that you take you drag and drop those types of comments in and if someone sends you a card and says thank you or if you get a really good result um, for a client or if you've done a great job on a piece of work that you've handed in um, you keep hold of that and you create for yourself a folder and those of you then are who are at work when it comes to appraisal time you can open it up and it's all there and those of you who are at university when it comes to doing those job applications you've got it all there and also if you're having a crap day it's all there yeah so you need to be really really meticulous about dragging stuff into that good file and, and sometimes, you know, if somebody says something nice to me, I might even make myself a note on email and put it in there, which sounds a bit sad. But I can tell you now that in six months time, you're going to forget what someone said to you about a great piece of work that you've done. So that's really important to keep evidence. The whole idea around imposter syndrome and part of it, this being a psychological syndrome, is that you can defeat it with evidence. You know, it's like if you're scared of spiders, you have to go through that process of kind of phobia treatment, yeah? And whereby you have to be provided with evidence that spiders aren't going to hurt you. Um, and it's the same thing with this. You have to make sure that you've got that file of evidence there. Calling it out for what it is, either yourself or finding a buddy, you know, talk to somebody. Maybe it's somebody on this session today where you say, you know, do you remember imposter syndrome? You know, we talked about that. I'm, I'm worried about this or I'm, going, I'm not going to go for that job or I'm not going to put myself forward for that promotion. Do you think that's right or do you think that's imposter syndrome? Yeah. Start to recognize this in yourselves like I did. Yeah. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night like I did thinking about that bonus and I thought this is me. This is imposter syndrome. Me not wanting to trouble two people, two men. Me thinking, oh, God, I don't want them to think I'm an upstart asking for a bonus. Well, why the hell not? Yeah. And it's, it's about that kind of challenging yourself and calling it out for, for what it is. When you're doing something, well, obviously, learn to accept compliments is my, my most, the favorite one, my favorite one in the world. Um, and, but also faking it till you make it. Yeah. Stop comparing yourself to somebody else. If you're new into role or if you're working alongside somebody who's been doing it for 50 years, great. They're going to be, have huge amounts of experience. Stop comparing yourselves to them. Stop comparing yourself to the best ever person doing whatever it is you're doing or that person that got A's and you only got B's. And if you are doing something that puts you out of your comfort zone, then you've got to fake it. Fake it till you make it. Yeah. When I started this role, there was no, I looked and looked and there was no qualifications you can do to become a diversity and inclusion consultant. There, there may be now, but there certainly weren't four years ago. And I just had to get on with it. And sometimes I thought, well, I've got no idea what I'm doing. And, you know, all I had to fall back on was, well, I say all, I obviously had 16 years of doing discrimination and inclusion work as a, as a, as a solicitor, but I'd never done kind of the, the type of work that I've ended up doing before, before I did it. But you know what, I've done it and I did it really well. I tried something new. And uh, at the beginning, I did have to kind of show a bit of confidence that I didn't necessarily have. So I did have to fake it a little bit. Um, but it worked. And, and of course, recognizing that is recognizing the fact that nobody knows what they're doing. Yeah. If we all knew each other's secrets, what comfort that would bring for us. So really something important to remember and think about. And as I've said before, kind of getting involved in mentoring, finding yourself a mentor, a buddy, a best friend, whatever, whatever you want to call it, finding that person and asking them to help you and to advise you and to guide you is, is really, really important as well. Um, <clears throat> so let's start by clapping for Kate. How awesome was that?